into our next session, which is on green infrastructure. The panel consists of Rec and Parks, who will be leading off, followed by planning, and then Department of Transportation. Um, planning and then um, Department of Transportation is here if there are any questions related to um, their, their participation in this activity. And so we're joined by Council President Young, Councilman Cohen, Councilwoman Sneed, Councilman Scott, Councilman Henry. So we'll start off with DPW. Is Kara back there? Yeah, she back there. Is Kara still in there? Thank you. Eric in there. Please proceed. Good evening. My name is Kim Grove, and I am the Office Chief of Office of Compliance and Laboratories with the Department of Public Works, and this is to present Service 674, which addresses surface water management for the city under the Department of Public Works. This service actually um, is used by several organizations within the department, including utility maintenance under the Bureau of Water and Wastewater, three of the sections of the Office of Compliance and Laboratories, the Office of Engineering and Construction related to stormwater capital projects, and also the Office of Asset Management related to um, stormwater <clears throat> functions in addition to the debt service uh, associated with those capital programs for stormwater. Uh, it is also funded by three of the enterprise utility funds in addition to having appropriations for state and federal grants. So um, <clears throat> what we have as, excuse me, <clears throat> This budget, the majority of this budget, does go towards MS4 compliance, but it is also used for non-MS4 uh, 
activities such as maintaining our stormwater infrastructure and uh, doing certain studies in improving that infrastructure. Um, basically, everything that is counted towards the MS4 is in this service with the one exception of street sweeping. Uh, we have in the budget items, uh, like I said, a lot of it is MS4. Um, we do have see an increase in the debt service because we have been spending more on our capital projects for stormwater projects. And then we also have an increase related to Office of Asset Management and those functions as we have been improving and increasing the functions of the Office, Office of Asset Management. They have started to now focus on stormwater management. The two, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, two key performance measures or indicators that you're seeing are related to the function of the plans review and inspection section, which is related to uh, development within the city, but we do have other key performance measures that are related to the other activities within the department, looking at how we are doing at in increasing green infrastructure to how much we are doing in related to inlet cleaning. So I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gross. What we'll do is we'll have all of the panelists present, and then we'll have questions afterwards. Fantastic. Then I am done. Okay. Um, Rec and Parks. <coughs> uh, I'm Bill Vondersek, the Acting Director of the Department of Recreation and Parks. And I'm going to let the Chief of Park Maintenance, Relke Myers, uh, present the slide on park maintenance. He's also serving as the acting chief of parks right now. Uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the workforce development initiatives that he's spearheading. And he was brand new on the job last year, right during the council budget hearing. So he has a year under his belt and he can't claim that he's a newcomer. So, Relke. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I think park maintenance speaks a lot for itself. You know, we, we have um, quite a lot of parkland to take care of. I think there's 6,500 acres. Uh, there's uh, 4,500 acres that has to be maintained. Uh, numerous ball fields. Uh, a normal uh, a day in our world would be ball field prep, repairs of uh, infrastructure, uh, pavilion rental preps. We do an awful lot of trash pickup. Uh, especially in certain areas where it's more um, not as populated, a lot of bulk trash that we do. Uh, we have a regular litter. Uh, we do special events, pick up. <clears throat> uh, we manage the mowing contract and the inmate contract. One of the main things we want to talk about that I think we're pretty excited about is our currently we're using an inmate contract where we have inmates using uh, to help us pick up loose litter in the park. Um, what we're trying to do is move away from that uh, in an effort to do so we're trying to contract it out and right now we do have a uh, proposal for bid that is in purchasing right now and our goal is the first goal obviously is to have a better job than was being done now but more importantly or as importantly is one of the things we put into our bid packet is the contractor who's awarded this bid is going to need to show proof that they're using city residents as their workforce. So it's kind of a two-prong attack where we're going to have a better service, we believe, and we're going to be putting Baltimore citizens to work at the same process. Um, we also <clears throat> lean heavily on the, uh, this past year we got $700,000 from the casino district, and we're trying to put that money to good use. We're doing it through repairs to various uh, park elements in that district, but we're also using it for some personnel costs. Uh, one of the things we did in that district is we created a weekend cleaning crew that, was, that comes up and tries to hit the areas that have a lot of high use on the weekends, and we're seeing good results from that. Uh, we're very happy with our mowing contract. Our mowing contract, we're in the second year of a five-year contract. Um, that has, uh, well, I'll, I'll quote a past uh, chief, uh, Calvin Bukula, 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 who said that he went through Druid Hill Park recently and he said he's never felt it's looked as good as it looks right now. So I think that's kudos to the mowing contractor because they're focused on one thing, getting the mowing done, which allows us to do all the other things that need to be taken care of out in the park system. 
Um, we have many partners that we partner with. Um, <clears throat> I, I did a head count real quick. It looks like there's 56 different ones that, throughout the city that we, we work with. Some are larger than others, you know, Civic Works, CJC Program, Blue Water Baltimore, Parks and People. We have 30 to 35 very active friends of groups that we work with, and then we also work with maybe um, uh, a total of, of um, there's my number here, 30 to 40 special one-day events, like uh, recently Comcast came in and helped us clean up one of our southern parks. I think we have a group from uh, uh, an organization down in D.C. from the Navy Department is going to help us replace all the planks on one of our bridges on the trail. Um, ultimately, um, what if I was asked on a wish list would be is uh, I feel we need more supervision in our staffing. Uh, our staff, uh, each yard could have maybe up, we have five yards in our park system and they go out and tend to their district. We might have 15, roughly 15 workers in that district and usually there's one to two supervisors. So if we break up those crews into two main crews, Obviously, there's not a supervisor for each one of those crews, and we found that if the crews are working under supervision, we're getting better results. So I, uh, that's kind of my quick synopsis of what we do, where we are, and, and kind of what I see as our wish list. Thank you. Great, and then, uh, then I'd like to bring up Eric Deal, our arborist, to talk about forestry. And <clears throat> the only preference I would make to Eric is I don't know, three, four, five years ago, we used to go to CityStat and there'd be like 10, 13,000 service requests and we never seemed to be able to make a dent in the service requests. And then uh, Eric came in, changed the way that we do business. We're down under 10,000 service requests. I think we're closer to 8,000 service requests. And he's taken the forestry division from this very kind of reactive, we just cut down trees in response to requests from citizens, which we certainly still do, to a more proactive stance where we're focused on tree planting and proactively pruning our trees and increasing the tree canopy and not using service requests as our management tool, but actually doing an inventory of all the trees in the city. So I'll let Eric talk a little bit about that. Uh, he said it pretty well right there. Um, that's it. We've become much more proactive. We're trying to put on a, a face of a, a positive image, uh, not just about after Hurricane Hannah or whatever and have, how quickly we can clean up the streets after a storm, uh, but it's all about the tree canopy. So the two items that we are actually identifying up there, and again, I'm Eric Deal, I'm Chief of Urban Forestry, City Arborist. So everything about trees, whether it's the overall city program, and this is one thing I'm looking forward to talking to city council more about. We have the Tree Baltimore program, and that is the overall Tree Baltimore program for all agencies and all nonprofits in the city. We're the umbrella program, whether it's Parks and People, Blue Water Baltimore, whether we work with uh, DPW or, or the DOT folks here, they all sit in with us, and it's one wide city effort. So that's a big part of what we do, and that's to increase the tree canopy. But as Bill said, um, I showed a, a target of 10,500 service requests for the, this year and next. Uh, maybe I was fudging because I want the numbers to look good, I guess. I could have said lower than 10,500. So like Bill said, we're at 8,200 for the last 12 months. So we beat our, or we're beating, a, we're gonna definitely beat our FY17 target. We also leverage very well. So back on Tree Baltimore, um, funds we get from other agencies, we've gotten from DNR, and that's the one reason we're able to keep and maintain our current level of service. It's not that we're necessarily getting much in the way more of general funds, although we're, we're holding steady, which is great. Uh, we're leveraging what we get, $500,000 grant from DNR, partnering and, and getting some substantial uh, assistance from DPW. Um, we work with the casino people, and it's really paid off. We also have, as you may know, some budget enhancements. So two reasons that we're looking, we're improving our numbers. One is Mother Nature. Well, we gotta be honest, we haven't had a major hurricane since 2012, right? So we're coming up on, you know, this is over four years now. But we've also begun what we call proactive pruning. So we're not waiting to hear about Mrs. Smith on so-and-so street upset, why does her tree look half dead? We're getting out and we're pruning every single tree in every single neighborhood. Now it's gonna take a while to rotate through and then we're gonna start it again, but we're doing that. 
Uh, the tree inventory Bill mentioned, we got uh, over a three-year period, three quarters of a million dollars for the first time ever. You got to know what you have out there, just like DPW needs to know where their pipes are and their utilities are, we need to know where the trees are. So this year we're collecting most of the data and by next year we'll have a complete citywide tree inventory. And that is our management tool. When we get a call from, say, one of the staff members of your office, we can turn around and say, oh yeah, this tree was inventoried, it was last pruned so-and-so, it's an elm, it's in so-and-so condition, we'll put it on the short list and take care of it. Um, we also got a, a loan, um, innovation loan. So we are becoming and have become a zero waste facility at the major dump site for the city. It's our wood dump site. It's a, at a place called Camp Small, if you're not familiar with it. Another thing to show people, and it's actually a rather innovative program that others are, are looking at around the country, that we're taking all our wood and it's being recycled. The prunings from trees, the trees that come down, the branches, we hope to get more and more into the leaf recycling. So it's a complete effort. Uh, again, I would like to just, um, as far as a wish list goes, we can always do more. The one thing I'm hoping we can get in the next 12 months or so, the one missing piece well, two, we need more GIS support. We're getting there. We have some great GIS specialists, but that's the 21st century. You need to get better on our mapping and tracking that. And also invasive vegetation management. So that's like kudzu vines, which is now arrived in Baltimore. Um, English ivy, honeysuckle, porcelain berry, and that will actually decrease our tree canopy. So one of the efforts we're making now, a new effort, again trying to be proactive, is to attack certain points in the city and decrease the invasive species in the city so that we can again cr increase our tree canopy. I think that's it. That's a real quick overview. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Deal. Right. Uh, next we'll have really planning, Director Stozer. Oh, Ms. Dratty. Hi, I'm Ann Dratty. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for the um, City at the Department of Planning. And um, the Sustainability Plan encompasses a lot of, a lot of our goals and uh, strategies encompass green infrastructure. Uh, we're currently working under the 2009 plan, but we're in the process of updating it. So we'll have a new plan by the end of this year, 2017. And we'll be continuing to push and support and promote uh, the creation and maintenance of green infrastructure. We partner with all these folks here. We're, we're on the lone partner with uh, Eric's team on Camp Small, and we work with uh, closely with Rec and Parks and um, on the street tree canopy, growing the canopy and planting trees, and we review forest conservation. Uh, we do urban farming on vacant lots where the green network plan that the city is developing is, falls under the sustainability plan. So we're looking at transforming vacant lots, particularly in neighborhoods with high vacancies, and creating green corridors to connect greening, green spaces all around the city. Uh, we will look at brown fields. Uh, we're, we're the, our office is kind of the convener and a connector. Everything that falls under green infrastructure and vacant lot greening is in the sustainability plan and people use that plan when they're writing grant proposals or I've seen it in uh, development plans, who, developers who, are, who have embedded parts of the sustainability uh, plan into their, into their own plans. So we're connected to all the city agencies and lots of partners like Rec and Parks are and we're all working together to, uh, to um, transform our vacant lots and make the city a greener, healthier place. Thank you, Ms. Dratty. Um, I, I know we have transportation here. Um, I don't, I mean, I think we've had presentations on these two slides before. I don't know if, you, if there's anything that you want to add before we um, ask questions. Uh, Patrick Fleming on behalf of the Department of Transportation. Um, so yes, yesterday the Department of Transportation reviewed all of its um, service areas, and so I have nothing add, to add at this point in time. Okay, but you, you, you'll remain, so if there are any questions. Right? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. So we'll begin with questions. Councilman Scott. Oh, and l let me just say that the, um, the other services um, related to rec and parks, we'll start that session at about 8.30, so this is, the focus of this particular session is on um, green infrastructure. And thank you, and I think that uh, actually I'm uh, asking question. The first question is actually on behalf of the council president who had to step out, and I, I think this is the per the best time. I don't think there's a perfect time for me to ask this question because it kind of relates to park maintenance. Uh, the council president has a question about uh, whether uh, the department has looked at 
having uh, inside of parks, Drew Hill Park, wherever, turf 90-foot baseball diamonds to be used, not just by recreation teams, but also like some of the high school teams who don't have, uh, do we have any uh, 90 foot diamonds inside of parks? I know the answer to that is yes, but also do has we looked at having turf ones put into some of our parks to be able to host events and tournaments and games like that, things like that? Um, <clears throat> I don't think that we've looked at 90 foot synthetic turf baseball diamonds for any of our parks. Uh, so far, all the synthetic turf fields have been soccer, football, lacrosse fields, and some have the little league diamond in the corner of them, like the one in Patterson Park. And uh, But no, we haven't looked at any specifically in Druid Hill Park, no. But I am correct by saying that we do have 90-foot diamonds inside of our parks, correct? Yes, we do, and we maintain... Uh, those 90-foot diamonds for the Baltimore City Public High Schools to yep. play on, and we don't charge them a nickel to do that. We just do it because we know it's the right thing. Thank you, sir. And then my my uh, second question, which is mine, is a, my last question. Just a question about the target, the fiscal 18 target for a number of city-maintained park playgrounds. So is that because we're we, the numbers seem to fluctuate, 113 to 123 to 119. Is it a stabilizing effect that's happening as the department looks at uh, being more modern, but also, for example, in the case of one, one in my district, moving it away from power lines? What's, what's the rationale behind the number? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's a bunch of things, and Ralkie will tell me if I miss any of them. Um, a playground gets vandalized, it gets burned beyond recognition, and it takes us a couple of years to get it into the CIP to get it back up. So I know that one, one like falls that. out. Uh, we build a new one in Northwest Park, that one gets added to it. Uh, there are, I don't know what the percentage is, I should probably end this to you, but uh, some of our playgrounds, I don't know, 40% of them have engineered wood fiber, 60% of them have poured in play and where the port and play gets vandalized, it takes us a while to get that repaired. I know you're working right now on getting a requirements contract for repairing port and play playground. So did I miss anything? I think it's good. For, for the community, and this is a, a ask, could you send like a detailed item of how much you guys spend to repair parks and where the parks are every year and how much roughly that is and how much it is to like renovate those parks and how you do that for the committee please for the playgrounds yeah playgrounds yep yes playgrounds we can do that, that. Yep. thank you done i, I want to dovetail on, on one of councilman scott's questions related to um baseball diamonds and our parks are there are there more or greater opportunity for maybe um, public-private partnerships or or uh, or um, private donations related to constructing, you know, fields with maybe some MOU that allows the entity to have some kind of access or use to the field. Are, are there are there greater opportunities that we could explore where that could be possible? You know, for us to get fields, you know, designed and built in exchange for you know, allowing an entity to have you know, you know, greater access or use? Um, I'd, I'd say there's always opportunities. We're always willing and open to listen to any kind of partnership or potential MOU that gets uh, fields built and or renovated um, so that there's more opportunities for kids to play. Um, I think an example that I can point out is uh, there's some talk down at Locust Point uh, with the Cal Ripken Foundation, and they want to build some diamonds down there. I think that's a great example, but uh, we're always, again, putting our feelers out for opportunities like that, uh, and when they're available, we certainly jump on them. Uh, I, I, I can't speak exactly, well, I, I can expand your question to more than ball fields because there's an organization called Kaboom, and they help us do playgrounds. And we've built many playground uh, that probably wouldn't have got built without the help of the partnership with Kaboom. So, okay. it, you know, if I could uh, editorialize just a little bit right here, I think we have plenty of fields 
you know, they might just need to be maintained or tuned up a little bit, and they've probably fallen out of maintenance because there isn't a demand for them. I think what's more important than having new fields built is having enough coaches. Mm -hmm. And coaches used to be volunteer, you know, parent volunteers. And so, uh, for example, we were down at Fred B. Lodig a couple of weekends ago and Coca-Cola came in and gave the rec center a once over. And one of the guys there from Coca-Cola said, I grew up in this neighborhood and I used to play in the Little League that was right here behind Fred B. Lodig and the Little League is no more. Um, it's no more because it, at some point it just kind of stopped having the volunteer parental involvement and it just kind of went away. And that's what we need to have. We either need to have parental involvement or paid coaches or something in between. Because I imagine that the area around Fred B. Lodig, there's no, um, it, there's probably still the same number of little kids around here. It's just, you know, who shows up on Saturday to coach the teams and, you know, who, who organizes the umpires, who gets the fields ready, all that other stuff that goes with having a successful Little League run. Um, you could look at the Hamilton Little League up in Councilman Scott's area, and it kind of ebbs and flows. And I think it's, I think whatever going up is, I don't know if that's, that's not ebbing, but it's, it's getting stronger now, but it, it hit periods where it was kind of on a decline. And so um, I think it has less to do with the physical infrastructure and more to do with the people involvement. No, I mean, I, I, I would agree. Um, but, I, but I think that there's still some need for the, the infrastructure as well. Um, you know, even as it relates to the um, visibility of baseball played at a higher level, you know, you know, for example, Coppin State, you know, they really don't, they don't have a field where they play. And then there are other, you know, um, you know, leagues or teams that could use a 90-foot diamond that would bring more people, you know, just to, say, for example, Druid, you know, Druid Hill Park. I mean, that 90-foot diamond, <laughs> you know, you can't play, at certain age, you can't play on that, the fence is too close. And so, you know, if we're gonna really revive baseball in the city, we, we, we've gotta have it, you know, played well at all levels. And so, th I think that's all, all he was getting to. But, but thank you, your point is well made. <coughs> um, I had a question for Ms. Grove. Um, uh, related to service 674, um, I, I see the narrative kind of explains the percentage of stormwater management, um, erosion, sediment control plans review. And so the actual for FY16 was 13%, uh, where the target was 80%. Is that, you see what I'm, Wait, um, page 419. Okay. And so um, it explained that the reason for that percentage was related to the increase in DPW capital projects and large private development projects that caused the backlog. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question would be, what measures are we implementing to um, address um, what I would imagine is a lack of staff to you know, be able to handle? Because having, let me editorialize, you know, having a lot of development projects m might be a, a benefit to the city but if we're not able to properly process these developments in a timely fashion, then um, you know, we're not taking advantage of this cycle of development and then we're frustrating developers who would wanna do work in the city. So what, what, you know, what are we doing to address the backlog and then you know, make certain that you know, we aren't caught like this again? So two years ago, we consolidated the functions within DPW. When a developer came in to do any type of development, they would have to go to water engineering, then wastewater engineering, then storm drain engineering, and also stormwater management and erosion sediment control just to get one set of plans reviewed. We consolidated that all into the Office of Compliance and Laboratories. And so now you have only one DPW representative looking at that. That was step one of just trying to make the process go a little bit better. We have added staff and we've been training them. But in addition to adding the staff, we have also been working with DHCD and DOT because all of our reviews 
support their permitting systems and sometimes just even a technology issue can come into it. So an example would be on DHCD's system for the plans review, we were still having to go in five different times to review the one project because of the way they had their, so just taking care of that technology has reduced some of our times on there. And then the third thing that we've been doing is trying to work more and more with developers to have them understand what the regulatory requirements are and what we look at as a plans review so that the quality of plans that are coming in are better so our time and our response can be uh, decreased and that learning curve has decreased. So we're seeing, a be we're seeing better numbers and we do track our response time in there. Um, one final thing that we've also been doing is we have started to include the developer and the owner in our communications with the design engineer. So it is not just solely with the design engineer that we're having that communication. So the developer understands the process. The developer also understands when we are having to send the same comments two and three times. Gotcha. So those things are all coupled with it and we are watching it. We are seeing improvements, but if we have uh, an engineer leave or we're having to fill a vacancy, sometimes we do hit a, a bit of a challenge. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Sneed. I'm just curious, um, when you mention um, cleaning up different parks and picking up loose leaf um, paper, I'm wondering if that includes smaller parks like Bochek Park and Elwood Park. Yes, that would include every park in each district is what the goal is. And another question is, um, I'm asking it because it seems like it's always trash, it's always community folks were out there picking up trash and a lot of times it's not even from the folks who are living in the area it's because that field right there on Edison Highway gets a lot of play from outsiders so I feel like they are constantly having bags of trash and it's on the residents so um, if you can check that out then if that's the case another question is since we are coming up upon um, the summer season I'm wondering how many youth workers you'll hire um, to kind of shadow and do some of the jobs like picking up the loose leaf trash and being out in the parks, learning about those types of uh, jobs and positions. So I feel like that's a launching pad for a career and um, what you're doing and what other folks are doing at Rex and Park. So I'm wondering, since we're like weeks away, how many youth workers you'll have? Okay, um, well, as far as our normal operating budget, we don't hire, we don't have seasonal staff. We don't hire anybody for the summer months. But I can talk to you about our CJC program where I believe we have 150 youth coming in that will be working in the park and not so much picking up trash, but they'll do more stuff like building trails and uh, trying to do things that uh, they will learn um, uh, kind of a, a, a trade, so to speak, that will catapult them for another job down the road. And that's a partnership we have with, um, with the DNR. And uh, again, I think, I think the number is about 150 youth that rotate through, 110, excuse me. So you'll have 110 youth with you this summer? Yes. In your specific unit? Yes, we have, we have a coordinator, a workforce development coordinator that that's their sole job is to work with the DNR and to work with the CJC kids and to actually come up with the different uh, projects they're going to work on through the course of the summer and supervise them and, tr and teach them uh, again the, the trades that they need to do and then there's also these reward things that are built into it like I know they get to go on like field trips that are, are fun things, not just work things. It's kind of a reward for doing a, a good job. And I'm asking that because you mentioned the um, workforce and how, you know, getting jobs. And this can be some of the 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds who do a good job over the summertime would carry them right over until um, if something opens up in the fall. I, I think that's a perfect opportunity. Um, my next question was... Oh, out of those positions, how many do you assign that live right in the area of these parks? So I'm wondering how many students are coming from, if you, if you know the breakdown, how many are coming from the Patterson Park, the Bocek Park, Edison Highway, or along the trails? That I believe that uh, DNR assigns us the, children, the youth, so we don't, we don't know where they're coming from. 
but if I could just add to what Relke said, um, we used to hire youth workers and we'd give them to the park district managers and the park district managers, I think you heard them say there weren't really enough of them and they would take the kids and the kids would go out and pick up litter and quickly in a week or two they'd get bored out of their skull and they'd be like, this is a really dumb job and I hate coming here to pick up litter in the park. And so we learned quickly that they needed more supervision and they needed more interesting jobs. And the state Department of Natural Resources and all the state parks, they had this killer Conservation Jobs Corps program and they were doing it great. The kids got good food, they got uniforms, they got great supervision, they built trails, they built picnic tables, they built, you know, campsites, they did all kinds, they built fishing piers, and then as Relke was saying, they went fishing, they went camping, they did all kinds of cool stuff. And so we went to our partners at DNR and we said, we'd want to do this in the city. And they came in and we do 110 kids a year and they pick up about half the cost, which was great. We pick up about half the costs. And I don't remember where they start every day, but like there's like three or four locations around the city where they start their day, and then they move around the city depending on what the jobs are. But they're not just going around and picking up litter. And you're exactly right. We want them to maybe come back to us later and explore a career in park maintenance. Thank you. And the next question, I'm just curious. When, when money comes out of and is approved for a board of estimates, how long normally does it take um, to hit you all for like improvements for Bocek Park? I'm just curious. So, As soon as money is approved by the board of estimates, how long does it get to us that we can spend it? Mm -hmm. One week. One week. Or less, yeah. I mean, once it goes through the Board of Estimates, we already have the money in our budget, and we are usually going to the Board of Estimates to, to have them approve a transfer of funds from a reserve account to an active account so that we can then begin spending it. So why is it taking so long for, why are, how come for the Bocek um, Park money, how come it's taken so long to start the projects of fixing um, some of the um, land in the, the field, and I guess some of the money will be used for the actual building. How come it's not going to be ready to start the project? I believe they said until like October, November. Now, we've already hired the architect, so there's like $700,000. We've already assigned a task to the architect. The architect went out there. Were, were you out there like a few weeks ago? No. Okay, so we stood in the building again with, uh, you know, the, the two delegates and I forget everybody that was there. And so we've assigned an architect to it and the architect knows that this is like a high priority. I imagine we're looking at a matter of a few months for them to come back with a design that they're then going to present to the community and make sure that we got everything that the community said that they wanted. And once the community says, yep, then they turn that into construction drawings and then we put it out to bid. Okay. And so the, the process of construction drawings, putting it out to bid, awarding it, having the bids you know, reviewed by MBU, then awarding it, notice to proceed. I mean, all those kind of procedural hurdles are months. You know, we're probably looking at, you know, breaking ground sometime in late winter, early spring. Okay, thank you. Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just had a couple really quick questions. Uh, one was already somewhat answered by uh, Councilman, Councilman Scott's question around uh, playgrounds. But I guess the larger question that I have, uh, and we've talked about like a couple possible sites, are, are there goals set for a certain number of playgrounds that you would like, or what, what are some of the process to kind of drive where you put playgrounds? And the reason I ask is, uh, we, you know, there's a neighborhood in my district, pretty large one that doesn't have a playground at all. Uh, and, the, and the distance that the kids have to travel is pretty significant uh, in, in, in every direction to get to. Uh, but so it seems like, is, is there a process to say, look, based on similar to the questions around rec centers, 
the same thing with demographic data used to decide, okay, well, we have a lot of young families here. This is probably where we want to direct these dollars. Is it that sophisticated or? <coughs> no. So I would say that if you looked at the Trust for Public Land, who analyzes uh, municipalities across the country and says, you know, how are they doing in these key categories, they would say that, or they do say that we score above the median or above average on the number of playgrounds per capita, okay? okay. Um, I would say that we probably, I know we don't have enough money in our capital budget to repair or replace the playgrounds as they become obsolete. So they become obsolete every 10 to 15 years. 15 years if we really kind of nurse them along. And so if you look at 120, you know, say every 15 years, you know, they're gonna wear out. I can tell you right now, we don't have enough money to fix the inventory that we have. Now having said those two things, should we be looking and saying, well, nobody's using that playground over here, and yet there's an area over here with tons of kids. We ought to have one here. Yes, that's the type of analysis we should do. Um, I would just be cautious before we add more playgrounds to an inventory that we're already challenged to repair, replace, and maintain. Okay. Uh, and the second question was around park maintenance. Uh, it, is there, what, what is the schedule for park space? Uh, and the reason that I add, as far as the, the mowing, um, both medians and, um, I think medians were somewhere in, in this presentation, but it seems like there's a couple spots, uh, at least again, speaking to my, my side of town, uh, that, that seem to be mowed on a pretty, pretty good basis, but then there's others that seem to be complaint driven. And most of those complaints seem to come from me, which I don't mind. Uh, I drive around a lot, uh, but, but it's still kind of like it makes me wonder a little bit. Uh, you know, is if I if if not for me just going nuts with my three one app every time I drive through my district, uh, would, would those things happen? Are there some that that slip through the cracks? It seems like. Um, yeah, sorry, I let you oh, answer. Well, yeah. first off, our mowing contract is it's a very strictly written contract. There's 16 mows for the whole calendar year. Right now, because we're in this early season where grass is growing faster with the rain and that's this perfect growing season, we're on a 10-day cut. But after July 1st, it goes to a 14-day cut. So, you know, I don't know about you, but I know I mow my grass about every five days. And so I think uh, if people expect our parks to look like their yards, they're, they're not going to be happy because, again, the contract just doesn't allow for it. If we have a wet summer, like after we go to a 14-day cut, that's really pushing the limit. Um, the medians are kind of tricky because most mediums fall under DOT. They don't fall underneath of us, uh, but th there's, that's not a 100% rule. So uh, I think even our own selves get confused sometimes. And, and But I'd like to think that once we realize it is an area that we are responsible for and we get called on it, uh, we I feel that our mowing contractor has been very reactive and then that, that it's never like we have to have that second call so I hope I answered your questions for you yeah no it, it's helpful uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk to you offline about one particular space but it was actually one one space and I, and I guess I don't want to like make it specific well, to the I, district I, but but one we it was kind of the driving force for us changing the name of the space uh, was because the residents felt like if we changed the name and, and gave it something a little bit more descriptive then it'd get mowed more uh, outside of you know being kind of a landmark site but uh, so th that's where it kind of dro drove the question was that is that actually true that we kind of have to keep pushing or no I, I, and actually to tell you the truth Bill reminded me uh, we have a brand new um, a contract employee who uh, it's kind of compliance driven and uh, she manages four main areas but the main area that she does is she's on top of the mowing contractor okay. and not only does she ride around and check out things um, <clears throat> but you know she makes sure that they're on schedule uh, if you've been out in some of these pretty rainy days, they're actually mowing in the rain. They got trash bags over their their body on the mowers because they're trying to keep up with that that schedule. Uh, it frees up my district park managers from not dealing with mowing complaints. It all goes through her. Uh, and one of the other things we found is sometimes if there's a wood line and you heard Eric talk about invasives, and those invasives are kind of creeping out of the woods, 
you know, sometimes the only thing I've noticed the contractors do is they kind of creep away from the wood line, which allows those invasives. And uh, her name is Jennifer Morgan. She's been really good about going out there and saying, you know, hey, I noticed you're kind of creeping there. Let's get that pushed back. And uh, again, I think what uh, Calvin, the past uh, chief, said is a direct result of of her being out there, uh, having the relationship with the company and, and working with them. Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, I live next to Lincoln Park, and that, that was an exact issue along Seminole Avenue was that the invasive yep. vines and everything were coming further and further out. Uh, and I had long-term residents who remembered the distance and were like, look, man, like every year this thing's getting closer. At some point, we're not even going to have any park space. On this right. And it came through and, and took and care on, of it. And on the yeah. reverse side, they're not res- if a limb would fall down into the park, they're not responsible for cutting that limb up. They just kind of mow around it. Mm-hmm. So when she sees that, then she goes, goes back to our district park managers and say, hey, you need to cut that limb up so they can get that mowing done. Because last summer without her, I was down in Carroll where the mansion is, and they, the curator there pointed out a limb that kind of fell right in the middle of that park, and they literally mowed around it the whole summer. And our guys never went and cleaned it up. So I think it's a really a, a triple win here with this, this arrangement we have going right now. Okay. Um, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So it's about 8.30, just um, giving everyone perspective on the time. Um, Councilman Cohen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is directed to the Department of Transit. Uh, you know, I was really excited about our green infrastructure plan, about uh, biking and walking, given the high density of traffic and cars in my district. Um, we had, a, as part of the bike master plan, a plan to build a protected cycle track all the way from Patterson Park to the harbor. Uh, I will say that the communication on that track has been extremely poor. Uh, the implementation of that track has been poor. Um, and then today I found out on an email chain that we are going to be downgrading uh, the Potomac Street cycle track, uh, which to my mind will then put folks who use biking in danger um, and really sort of undermines the bike master plan. And this is all because um, the fire department claims we're gonna need 20 feet clearance in either direction Um, My question, Patrick, for DOT is, um, does the decision to downgrade the design on Potomac Street to what is a substandard fit um, delegitimize our green infrastructure plan and the rest of the bike master plan? um, And what is DOT going to do to ensure that we are living up to the standards that we as a city have set for safety for people that don't drive cars. Uh, so I, I apologize, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with the project, I'm familiar with some of it and I do understand that there was uh, information provided later, or not that long ago today specifically about this and letters were delivered to residents on Potomac Street um, about some of the changes. Uh, I I don't know, I'm sorry, I can't exactly comment about um, what this will have, uh, how exactly this will impact um, in bike infrastructure in the future. This doesn't uh, change DOT's commitment to providing bike infrastructure throughout the city of Baltimore um, and to be able to provide safe uh, facilities for all users of the right-of-way, be it pedestrians, cyclists, or motorists. I would simply say that this decision um, really undermines the integrity of, when we think about green, safe, complete streets, uh, the decision to remove um, this track based on a, a number that 20 feet that really doesn't fit in southeast Baltimore. I mean, we have small streets. I live on Glover Street. It is, there's no way you got 20 feet. Um, it, it just seems to really undermine the city's commitment to complete streets, to green infrastructure, and to uh, a walkable, bikeable city where folks don't have to rely on their car 
all the time. I understand what you're saying, and I think that this has um, brought a, 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 an issue to the surface that we are working through quickly to be able to not allow this to prevent us from moving forward on, on other projects in a, in a safe manner for everyone. Okay. Well, I would hope that uh, the same standards are applied, and I hope that we, when we say we are going to have a bike master plan and that we make that commitment and we hold to it and we don't do fits and starts because I think uh, residents across the city who rely on alternative modes of transportation deserve to be able to get from place to place safely, and right now we've sent the wrong signal to them. Thank you. Councilman Dorsey. Thank you. Um, I want to second basically everything that was just said by Councilman Cohen um, and talk a little bit more about that commitment. Um, your, where is this presentation? Your presentation says the FY target for number of miles of new bike infrastructure is eight miles. Um, we only hit 2.6 this last year. That's the entire length of the Maryland Avenue cycle track. That's only one street um, and only two miles in FY15. And my recollection is that that's probably not particularly safe cycling infrastructure, so it brings into question what the commitment here of eight miles is to do actually safe green infrastructure. I think that green infrastructure is great conceptually, but it's meaningless if it's not usable for people who require actual safety to get from one place to another. And um, to my understanding, we don't have eight miles of complete designs and the funding to, to do eight miles of work. Can you talk a little bit about actually the capacity to meet this target? So I know this, I believe this question was asked yesterday at our full presentation um, and the deputy director did respond about, um, so I, I don't know the full answer of how the, the um, goal was, it, uh, was identified. Um, uh, so I'll have to get back to you on that because I just, I'm not exactly sure how the goal was identified at eight miles versus some other number. Um, the 2.6, I know that it is, um, there's a focus on not, on the type of bike infrastructure has changed. It's no longer just adding sharrows to a road and considering that to be um, appropriate bike infrastructure. We're looking at, you know, doing in a, what, it, you know, more to b provide protection for our bicyclists. Um, than in addition to just designating a share on a road that bicyclists are indicated that they can use the, the travel lane. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on the exact. Is it possible uh, Jay Decker could come up and speak to this? He's here. I imagine he's here for a reason. Could you just let us know who you are, what you do? Hi, uh, my name is Jay Decker. I am currently the bike share coordinator and do facilitate a lot of the uh, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure projects after Caitlin Doolin, the bicycle and pedestrian planner, left a couple months ago. My understanding is that the protected bike lane network and the bicycle master plan, uh, as adopted by the planning commission, has us uh, committed to building out 16 miles of protected cycle infrastructure every year. Is that more or less accurate? I believe it's 16 miles every two years. Every two years. So yeah, yeah, eight miles every year, I believe is what it says. Okay, I appreciate that clarification. Um, how many different projects does that involve around the city? Uh, so it does fluctuate year by year. It, and we do have this, this plan is actually prioritized on a one to two year, three to four year, and a five year kind of scale, is that correct? Yeah, so um, there was the, uh, I think it was 2007-ish uh, original bike master plan that the city adopted and then it was updated in 2015 um, and then this past year was the 2017 separated bike lane network addendum 
to the bike master plan. Um, the idea behind that addendum was the bike master plan was great, um, but it was entirely too comprehensive. It had, you know, hundreds of miles of street facilities on there, which is not practical um, for a number of reasons. So this, the separated bike network plan was in effect building off of the momentum from the Maryland Avenue cycle track uh, to establish that this is the new kind of high quality facility that a lot of cities are doing and Baltimore wants to shift that way as opposed to the Sharrows that Patrick talked earlier. Uh, and so it kind of establishes more or less a backbone network of what could be established within two to five years um, through that um, with the goal of connecting 85% of the city um, through low stress or um, highly protected bike facilities. And um, I happen to have attended one of the most recent Mayor's Bicycle Advisory Commission meetings um, and know that we were looking at the next year's plans which involved I think about <coughs> nine different projects and we were in a position of looking at the level of funding that was available to meet next year's obligation and having to choose um, somewhere about a quarter to a third of what we were actually supposed to be doing in that prioritized plan because the funding was not available to actually execute next year's plan. Can you speak to that funding level at all? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I assume with kind of everyone that gets up on here, um, you know, we have to look at the resources available and figure out what we can get done we have versus necessarily what we'd like to do or what's in a plan. Um, so kind of going on what Patrick said, <coughs> back when the you know, bike master plan was created, it called for X miles of bike facilities to be developed you know, every year. Um, but that was back before you know, Sharrows were somewhat of an acceptable facility type. Um, and I could do 50 miles of those in a week um, because it's just a sticker on the ground. Um, when we're looking at doing large scale, <coughs> high profile, protected, facilities. It takes uh, a, quite a lot of community establishing, working with people, figuring out what the proper design is, interagency coordination, because it is a significant um, restriping of the roadway. Um, so we're looking at kind of more of a quality over a quantity approach, um, where it's more important to have a good facility in a limited numbers than a lot of poor facilities. Um, so that's kind of the rationale that DOT has taken to use our resources to navigate to higher quality facilities um, in limited numbers. So is it possible for us to kind of qualitatively assess what this eight mile commitment is to? Is this to good high quality bicycle infrastructure um, or just Sharrows on the road. We will get back to you on what the, that is. Um, and what that, <laughs> what that specific dollar commitment is? Yes. Um, my understanding is that, um, and I, I'm thankful that we have a, kind of a cross section of agencies involved here right now um, because the cycling infrastructure that we have kind of planned, my understanding is that all of that is from a limited pool of state and federal grant money that we're actually getting state bikeways grants to use as the 20% match that is required in order to get federal transportation alternatives grants and that there is not a dollar in the city's general fund budget committed to building out any of this and that we could accomplish the next year's uh, planned cycling infrastructure with a commitment of $1.5 million that um, we would get a four times match on from federal transportation alternatives grants that we seem to get every single time we apply for them. And I think that this uh, kind of four to one match is exactly the kind of way that we should be investing money. I'm wondering if that's another thing that we could, given the, um, cost of life safety um, that would be abated uh, across the city and the impacts of that, um, given the health benefits that would be uh, improved because of that, um, given the economic development that is known to be stimulated by the presence of safe cycling infrastructure, particularly in commercial areas, if that's um, something that we could use innovation funds for. 
Uh, that seems like an innovative way to stimulate economic development in the city and see a return on that. Um, I'm wondering if we could request any kind of analysis of potential returns on safe cycling infrastructure investment from the city as a priority. As a priority. Is that possible? That would be a longer term project, but um, we'll take a look at it. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate you coming up, Jay. I know. Um, I do want to talk about one other spot uh, along Urban Avenue and Lake Clifton Park. Uh, there is a persistent problem of water running off of the park into the street uh, year after year after year, and um, it seems to be the fault of an under underground stream. Um, Councilman, is this this is the district specific issue? I'll leave it alone. It, could the appropriate agency officials make sure you talk with Councilman Dorsey immediately following this hearing? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Councilman Dorsey, back to you. You good? I'm good. Thank you. Um, any other questions for this panel? All right. Thank you. That concludes the green infrastructure panel. Uh, last up is Department of Recreation and Parks, all their services. Oh, who's 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 taking care of Councilman Dorsey? <laughs> Trees are sitting in a plop of water with the golf course. It's a multi Eric, I, I appreciate you. You're great. Please tell that to the councilman, make sure he has all the information he needs. The correct answer is me. Listen to this too, it might have something to do with surface water management. Tried to take the field, the marching band refused to yield. How you doing? Know? Okay. I'll be glad. Well, I'm not going there. I'm going to take you that way. It's not that much fun. Got you covered. Okay, great. Other page. Ralphie. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vondrasek, let's take it away. All right, I'm Bill Vondrasek, Acting Director of the Department of Recreation and Parks. And um, seated to my right, my far right, is Ken King, our Chief Fiscal Officer. Um, Joanne Kaysen, who's in charge of Seniors and Therapeutic Rec. Oh. I'm drawing a blank on our partner here. Bob, Bob Signer, thank you. Woo. I, I should be in seniors. Um, Bob Signer, who's in charge of therapeutic rec, and then Fran Spiro, who's in charge of everything else left in the department. No, really, she has volunteers, special events, our permits area, and outdoor recreation, um, including bike programs and kayaking. Um, and so I think what I should do is let each one of them um, introduce their service. So Joanne, seniors. Good evening, I'm Joanne Kaysen. I'm the Division Chief of the Special Populations Division. Again, I'm the Division Chief for the Special Populations uh, Division for Recreation and Parks. In Recreation and Parks, we provide programs for all ages and all abilities hence the Special Populations Unit. Uh, I'm first gonna talk about the Senior Citizens Division. Uh, the Senior Division is actually a very small division. Uh, our budget is uh, less than 1% of the whole Recreation and Parks budget. Uh, it's very small, but we touch a lot of seniors across Baltimore City. I'd venture to say that seniors come to our programs from every neighborhood in Baltimore City. Uh, we provide recreation programs for seniors in the rec centers. We work with seniors in senior apartment buildings. We work with a lot of 
faith-based ministries uh, throughout the city. We do big special events throughout town. Uh, just today, as a matter of fact, uh, today is National Senior Health and Fitness Day. It's a celebration for active aging all across the United States. And today we had over 300 seniors in Patterson Park for a healthy walk. Uh, we had vendors doing health screenings. The mayor was there. Uh, we partnered with the health department Commission on Aging and the uh, Health Con Commissioner was there with us today. Uh, so we do a lot of work with the Health Department in providing our, our recreation programs and health promotion events for Baltimore's older adults. Uh, we program for older adults 50 years of age and older. Now the Commission on Aging, they also have senior centers, however you have to be 60 years of age to go to those centers. Uh, so we do reach a lot of people that do not go or are not able to go to the senior centers. And we do work very closely with the health department in providing senior programs. Uh, we do events throughout the year, uh, the Senior Splash, Dance for Your Heart, we do intergenerational proms, where we work, again, very closely with the Commission on Aging. Uh, the senior centers that the Commission on Aging runs are very, uh, they, they're geographically based. You have to live within catchment areas to go to the senior centers. They charge dues. Uh, our programs in recreation and parks are for anyone who lives anywhere in Baltimore City. There are no dues to attend our programs. And for whatever reason, a lot of folks decide they don't want to go to senior centers, particularly us baby boomers who don't think that we're older. Uh, and so, there's, so they come to the recreation center programs instead. There are 112 older adults, 60 years of age and older in Baltimore City. And if you look at the performance measures for the Commission on Aging's uh, attendance at their senior centers, 45,000 seniors uh, touch a senior center or a senior program throughout the course of the year. That leaves, you know, over, that's less than half of all the seniors that are in Baltimore City. So we feel that there's still plenty of seniors for recreation and parks to reach out to. So again, we, we work very closely with the Commission on Aging, uh, collaborating with them on a number of events. And one event, or, or one, uh, one program I did want to mention to you was uh, uh, a year or two ago, the Senior Center in Cherry Hill closed. It was operated by the Catholic Charities, and they closed the Senior Center down. The Commission on Aging had no facility, had no staff to run senior programs in this, in this neighborhood, which was much needed programs for older adults. The Commission on Aging came to Reckon Parks, and we found the location, the rowing center on Waterview. We arranged the staff, and they have given us grant monies to provide senior activities in that neighborhood, Cherry Hill, that they were not able to, to run anymore. So again, I think a big part of what we do, because we are such a small budget, is we collaborate a lot with the Commission on Aging, Living Classrooms, University of Maryland, anybody and everybody that we can find, that we can reach out to, to provide programs in a more creative way for Baltimore's, Baltimore's older adults. I think that's it in a nutshell, if anyone has any questions. And I can also tell you a little bit about our other program that we have in the Special Populations Unit, and I'm going to bring Bob Signor up, and this is our Therapeutic Recreation Program. And these are our programs for youngsters and adults with disabilities. And I'll let Bob tell you a little bit about that. Which, which side are... Uh... Hang, on, hang on one second. Okay, um, I'm going to ask if you guys can keep the total agency presentation to no more than, than five to ten minutes moving forward. Thank you. I'll go quickly. Good evening. My name is Bob Signor. I'm the uh, Therapeutic Recreation Program Coordinator for uh, Baltimore City Rec and Parks. We provide a variety of recreational opportunities and services for individuals with disabilities in both specialized and inclusive environments as mandated by the federal law American with Disabilities Act. The focus of the TR division is providing programs that promote a healthy lifestyle and physical activity conducted in a fun and enjoyable manner at recreation centers, special facilities, and parks throughout the city. 
over the last five years, we've seen a significant increase in the number of programs that we provide and the participation rates. Uh, each programming cycle, we do 30 to 40 programs, which includes aerobics, arts and crafts, disc golf, canoeing, fishing, variety of programs. Uh, we also have a significant partnership with Special Olympics Maryland. We're really proud of the fact that up until about four years ago, there was no adult programs for Special Olympics in the city. Uh, now we have two soccer teams, we have two basketball teams, we are currently in our bocce ball season which has over 40 uh, participants so we're really proud of that. We're also, our focus currently now is also inclusion. Uh, we're putting a significant amount of resources into inclusion which will open up all of our programs that the uh, agency provides to everyone no matter what their ability uh, level is. Down and dirty, I tried to keep it quick. Good evening, um, I'm here to talk about the park programs and events, uh, service number 653. Um, our service is it's a fairly newly created service over the last four or five years and uh, the vision is that we are trying to foster the next generation of park stewards through creative and engaging park programs and events. Um, vibrant and active parks are, are vital to having healthy communities and um, we've been very lucky to have supportive partners and um, grant funds that support that supplement the um, 580 some thousand we bring in through our permits revenue to support our um, division and as Bill said we're we have a lot of different activities we run the permits office which issues like 900 picnic rentals uh, we work with DOT for on 400 special event permits and 700 athletic field permits every year to engage and we use the permits office as a programming mechanism, not just as a uh, revenue generator. So we look for partners all the time to come in and activate park space. We have a special events unit, which is right now just one person. Um, but we've initiated um, our new Rhythms and Reels series this year. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I have this. We have over 140 events in the parks this summer, concerts and movies. It's a great program. The next first one is this Friday night in Franklin Square Park. Um, I have a whole bunch of them. Yes, they're all free, of course. Yes, they're all free. Um, we've initiated a new $5 5K series that's going to be in all the parks this summer. Um, we have a new Art in the Park program that's starting in a partnership with uh, Art with the Heart. Um, we also have the Ranger program, which is a seasonal customer service unit. Our outdoor recreation unit uh, runs the canoe and kayaking program out of Middle Branch in the Inner Harbor. We run a biking program uh, that supports the DOT bike program. We run hiking and camping programs from, for urban youth. We also manage the volunteer program for City Rec and Parks. Uh, which Ralke mentioned to you, Comcast, we, um, in fiscal six, 16, we had over 13,000 volunteers, 204,497 volunteer hours, which gave a total value to the department of $5,400,787. And we also managed the Cary Murray Nature Center, um, whose goal is to connect children with na nature in our most beautiful and uh, the second largest urban wilderness park in the country, Gwynn's Falls Leakin Park. Um, is that it? Okay, thank you. Councilman Henry. Thank you. Um, so I actually have questions about services that you don't necessarily appear to have people here to talk about, like aquatics and community recreation centers or Friday at 2 or 3 o'clock, I believe. I'm sorry. Do I have my calendar mixed up here? I thought this was Rec and Park's other services. Yeah, so, yes. O other services besides? Besides aquatics and community <laughs> rec centers, yes. And youth and adult sports, I believe, are all on Friday. In the so is that, is that the case? It, oh, why did, so why is Rec and Parks chopped up like that? It, it, okay, I'm sorry. It, it just said... Rec and Park's all other services. 
on my schedule, so I thought, yeah. okay, so is there uh, youth sports is on um, youth sports, but like if we want if I want to talk about pools or rec centers, should that be today or you're the councilman, you can do what you want, sir. <laughs> well, I'm glad somebody thinks that. Um, well, okay, so let me let me let me raise these issues now. And um, may, may, maybe that way we can have an even more informed discussion on Friday. Sure. Um, uh, this, this won't be an, an issue that you're unaware of. Um, I, I, I want to talk about Walter P. Carter. Uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the aquatics service description, which says the city operates six large park pools, 13 neighborhood walk-to pools, 20 wading pools, and three indoor pools. If I've done my arithmetic properly, and that may not be a certainty, that looks like we have 42 pools. If we have 42 pools in a city that has 14 council districts, each with a roughly equal amount of population, you would like to think that there would be three pools for every 43,000 some people in Baltimore. Am I, is there something wrong with this? There's something wrong okay. with that, yeah. So what's, what? I, I think it should be maybe two waiting pools. So that would like, be a, We have 23 pools. We have 23 pools. Total. Total. Yeah. That's a big difference. Indoor park pools, walk to pools, splash pads. I think the number is 23. Okay. Um, is this, who generates this? Is this generated by Rec and Parks or by budget? Uh, it's, we, were, we were charged with proofing it, so if there's a mistake on there, it's our fault. Okay. For the record, I think Mr. Klein was. I couldn't tell. If I was going to say it's a collaborative effort. It's a collaborative effort. Okay. So that's, that's nice. Okay. Um, so he's willing to get under the bus with you a little bit. Um, but here, here's my issue. My issue is that there are more pools than there are council districts. And we have one pool in our district at Walter P. Garter, what I su suspect from this would be considered a neighborhood walk-to pool. That neighborhood walk-to pool is 1.7 miles west of the next closest I'm sorry, two miles west of the next closest pool to the east, which is Lake Clifton. It is 1.7 miles east of the next closest pool to the west, which is Roosevelt Park, and there is no pool to the north of it. And if there's a pool to the south of it, I'm not sure what the next closest one would be. And that pool is getting ready to go away if the school system's feasibility study for renewing, for redoing Walter B. Carter holds. I'm making this point to say that in our last presentation by the capital um, budget people at planning, they said that Rec and Parks is getting 17, roughly $17 million of capital this year in fiscal 18. Um, they, did, they were not able to say what um, you're getting next year. Do you know yet what it says in the capital plan for Rec and Parks next year. For fiscal 19? For fiscal 19. No, we didn't even make that request. You haven't yet. made that request yet? Right. Okay, so this is what I need. I need either Rec and Parks to have the rebuilt pool for Walter P. Carter on site in their fiscal 19 request with a commitment from the administration to keep it or I need Rec and Parks to stand with the community and myself in explaining to the school system that they're gonna to have to figure out a different design for Walter P. Carter because they cannot simply remove what is effectively the only pool in North Baltimore so that they don't have to go up to a third story on the new school they're building. Um, that's pretty much where I am and I need that commitment during budget season. This is not something where we can work it out over the course of the next year because the school system is moving forward right now with their feasibility process and we cannot let them decide this is what they're gonna do and then have no pool in North Baltimore. So, not really technically a question, I suppose, but I guess the question is, can we solve this problem by Friday? I'll commit to trying to solve it by Friday. Okay. I, I'm fully aware of and I, and I, as you and I know. And I want to tell you, I have appreciated all of the 
hard work that Rec and Parks has already put into trying to solve this issue. Um, I have told multiple stakeholders on this that um, I consider your entire agency to be one that has been kicked around for the last generation, and you have spent um, more so than most agencies in Baltimore City government, you have spent your time trying to build more bricks with less straw. And I want you to know I appreciate that. I know my colleagues appreciate that. I have high hopes that the administration now appreciates that to a greater deal than they have in the past. Thank you. Councilman Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, before I ask my questions, I. Uh, I was a little confused because the presentation that we were given actually gave all the rest of the services. Are we not asking questions about recreation centers or things like that of that nature? I thought we were covering that on Friday. Okay, so with that being said, then I have no questions and we can send these good folks home until Friday. Oh, what time are they coming on Friday? What's that? What time are you guys here on Friday? Um, 12.30. Oh, I'll be here. All right, I, I'll table my questions about, well, my questions are actually for the administration who is MIA at the moment anyway, so it's not actually for recreation and parks. I'll table my questions until Friday. Sounds good. Councilman Pink, uh, Councilman Burnett. Uh. Yeah, it's just a, a quick question, um, and this is actually for Mr. Klein. Would you be able to pro provide us with a breakdown of the expenditures for table game revenue? Uh, I see that we're getting uh, seven point uh, table game revenue. Oh, yeah. um, so there's seven two seven point two million. Uh, but as it relates to this particular panel, uh, the breakdown for Parks and Rec uh, and the three point six million. I've, I've seen it kind of spaced out in different presentations that certain. But is there a single space that we can look and, and find yeah. all in one chart? Um, I don't think we have it on one chart in the budget book but it's so the 7.2 million under state law um, there's two two percent now taken off the top for a state um, minority and women business program but the remaining 98 percent is split 50 50 between um, school construction so that goes into a, the special fund um, for paying debt service on the school modernization program <laughs> And then the other 50% is for uh, rec recreation and parks facilities. This year we're using uh, 2 million f f in the capital budget for the Cherry Hill project, recreation center project. And then the remainder, it's about a million, goes into um, the rec centers and half a million into aquatics. The, the long-term plan for recreation and parks share of the funding is to support the operating costs of new and expanded recreation centers. Um, at this point, sorry, you know, sorry, I was trying to jot down. Sorry, you said two million for Cherry Hill. Where was the other? Two million for Cherry Hill. That's in the capital budget. Um, a million in community recreation centers. Half a million in aquatics. And what I was saying was, that in the long term, uh, our plan is that the the full recreation and park share of table games will support operating costs related to new and expanded recreation centers. Okay. And you know that the, the uh, master plan for recreation centers, I think, is being reviewed by the, the new administration. So um, we don't know. I, don't, I can't tell you precisely what that's going to look like at this point. But um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we will have continue to, to build new and expanded centers. and and then um, ultimately the funding would be on the operating side. And the only thing I would add to that is, um, as uh, Andrew has said, you know, the pools typically operated like a $2.9 million in expenses. They were funded at like 2.4 in general funds. So we said we're going to take like 500 of the table games and make the aquatics budget what it should be. The million for the rec centers was, hey, when we build Cherry Hill and Cahill, let's make sure we have enough money to program and maintain these rec centers. So the, but sorry, in so the, that, so the one million is spread across all of the rec centers. Well, so right now what we're doing is we're using the one million 
uh, for temporary expenditures is what I would call it. You know, opening rec centers on Friday and Saturday nights, opening rec centers on Saturdays, some rec centers on Saturdays, things like that. But what we have done the last year or two, and I will recommend to the new director that we continue to do, is our outdoor recreation. I mean, we think about recreation and it's going into a building where kids can either play basketball or be in a game room or sit in front of a computer or do something indoors. And I think we really need to think about recreation and community recreation centers is getting the kids outside. And so we have the programs that you just heard about from Fran, where we're getting little kids out on bicycles that have never been on a bike before, and we're providing the bike, and we're providing the mentorship, and we're providing a safe experience, and kids are getting to ride bikes, and they never used to be able to do it. And we're getting kids out on kayaks, and we're letting them practice in a kayak, in a pool, so they feel secure. When we put them out on the middle branch, they're not freaking out that they're out in a kayak out in the, the middle of the water. She started all these programs with zero general fund dollars, zero. It was all grants. And so we're, while our community recreation center budget is $14 million, and she's impacting tons of kids with zero general fund dollars, I said, I'm gonna take some of this table game money and give it to her so she has to keep stop going out and begging for funds to get kids on bikes and in kayaks. So we gave her $200,000. And I would hope that we continue to give her $200,000 and maybe $300,000 and maybe $500,000 because we're getting kids on camping trips and we're getting kids on rope courses out at Outward Bound, and we're getting kids fishing, and we're getting kids biking and kayaking and doing all the stuff outdoors that they should be doing that is currently funded with zero general fund dollars. Thank you. Councilman Pinkett. Oh, yeah, I, I just had a question related to service six, 51 recreation for seniors. So um, I see that FY16 total is like 6,155 for total attendance at senior rec. Do we have any idea of the individual numbers of seniors that we're, that we're reaching? The Be number? No, individual. So I'm, I'm assuming that this total is, That's you know, Okay, okay, that 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 looks better. And um, it, it, not that this was a reflection on your. When I when I looked at the budget, I, I actually was surprised to see, from my perspective, how little we we invest in the seniors. Um, I you know I just assumed that we did more, but it seems like we 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 sometimes we forget our seniors. So um, what what do we do? Oh, who provides the transportation? Is, does that come out of this budget as well for, because oftentimes when I visit senior centers or senior housing, that, that is really the impediment for, for the seniors getting from, you know, their um, living facilities and whatever to, and so they will, they will go where there's transportation. And so if we, if we really, I, I really think that we would have more seniors engaged and and actually probably some of our rec centers filled during the day, daytime if we dedicated or committed the transportation money. Because I, it's, not, it's not for lack of seniors wanting to participate, it's just the inability of, of them getting there. No, you're right. Can you speak into the microphone, please? I'm sorry, yes, you are, you're absolutely right. Transportation is the key. Uh, we do have a senior bus that we use daily to transport seniors to and from events. Plus, when we do these big special events uh, and we sell tickets to these events, we incorporate 
an additional cost, we have to, an additional cost for the bus services. For instance, again, that, that event we did today at Patterson Park, Senior Fitness Day, we had seven school buses that brought seniors in from all over Baltimore City to this, to this event. And, and, this, and, and I'll, I'll finish with this. This isn't, isn't necessarily a question, but maybe a challenge to you all if you haven't done it, to perform some kind of analysis that if we, if we um, provided you know, an increase in money for transportation, would it, how many more seniors would it yield participating in our program to sure. kind of justify you know, identifying resources for that? Because I, I mean, I know all the seniors I talk, that, that's it. That's the, and and our, our, I think our, like when I go to the why, our, our rec centers aren't just about youth. They should, I think a healthy why has a good mix of all of, ages. Of all ages. And, and I think our rec centers are lacking because we, 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 we don't have that proper mix of seniors utilizing the center as well. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was all I had. Sure, we certainly will look into that. Council, well, and, and the Council. only other thing I would add, Andrew, is it's the perfect complement because frankly, the seniors don't want to be there when all the kids are running around. So we let the seniors be there during the day and then they clear out by the time the kids start coming in after school. And you can go to some of our rec centers now, she could probably name them all, and you'll walk into Rita Church and there'll be 15 seniors there at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so the great thing is about 40 rec centers is, yes, it's about transportation, but they're all around the city where, you know, I don't know how the folks get to Rita Church that get there, but there's 10 or 15 seniors there every day. Um, so. I was just gonna say, I'd like to see more focus on 47 year olds. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. Councilman Cohen. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I did want to talk for a minute about the disparity in pool access. Um, we've had a number of questions around who gets to use the Patterson Park public pool, and at times it's felt like uh, young people um, from different neighborhoods are actually discouraged from using it. Um, the standards uh, that are applied are, seem to be pretty inconsistent. There was a big kerfluffle over what type of bathing suit. Uh, I'm sure you, as you know, um, it's caused a lot of issues. But also in speaking to my colleague, um, you know, it, Young people rely on pools during the summer to stay cool and to stay out of trouble. Um, I, I think it's disturbing that uh, there are no pools in the 13th district. Um, you know, while it's great that we've got two pools in my district, um, that, that is really concerning because people north of Patterson Park and McKeldery Park, uh, you shouldn't have to travel that far to get to a pool, um, you know, and I know there's a new director coming in, but I'm curious what we're doing, uh, if there's a plan to address some of the disparities that I've seen in terms of who gets to use our pools in the city of Baltimore, who we build pools for, and why there aren't any pools in my colleague's district. Um. Well, let me talk about I, whoever wants to use a city pool can use a city pool. Sure. I mean, nobody is turned away. Um, I know that uh, our aquatics policy, sometimes the scheduling at pools is segmented, and I think it's segmented to provide as safe uh, an experience as possible. Um, I believe in terms of Patterson Park, uh, we've had a lot of discussions with Senator Ferguson and some of the community folks, and when we did the big splash at Patterson on Saturday, I turned to Senator Ferguson and I said, are we getting there? We're getting to the bottom of it. Everything's going in a good direction. And he said, yes, we are. So he's, I think that we uh, have made concessions on however complicated the pool schedule used to be, it's been simplified, and I think folks are happier, was my report. Um, I do th know that he's, uh, Daryl, our aquatics manager, has placed new leadership at the Patterson Pool, 
And so the young lady that runs the Riverside Pool and kind of keeps the neighborhood down there happy is also in charge of the Patterson Pool this year, uh, Nikki. Um, so that's talking about uh, access to the pools and leadership at the pools. Um, in terms of putting a, another pool in a district that maybe is lacking, uh, we'd love to build a million pools. I mean, they're an indoor pool, an outdoor pool is probably uh, a million five, two million, an indoor pool is probably 3.5 to $2 million. And then along with that comes the costs for lifeguards and, you know, chlorine and everything that goes along with it. So it, it's, a, it's a resource issue. Um, the park pools that are mentioned here, the 13 neighborhood walk do pools, uh, I'd say just about every one of them was built in the 1970s and they're a physical plant nightmare to keep running. Yeah. So as some of those maybe get retired, is there an opportunity to build a new pool somewhere? Um, you know, I know that at Boat Check, we're hoping that um, after we do the $700,000 improvement to the field house, that that spurs more investment from the state. Um, Delegate Branch seemed to think that, you know, there might be more in the pipeline there. And so maybe a pool will end up at Boat Check Park. Yeah, I, you know, and um, definitely appreciate the work around Patterson Park. Um, you know, I would just say that because our city has so many challenges with transportation, uh, it, it does mean it does lead to questions of access and mobility. Because again, you know, if if you live two and a half miles away. Um, given the sorry state of our bus system, uh, that can make it extremely hard, especially if you're someone with little kids or, you know, and again, I'm sort of speaking right now as chairman of the Education and Youth Committee. I, I just know a lot of families struggle during the summer uh, to get to pools that are not within walking distance. I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, you know, if, if uh, well, well, we'll wait, for, maybe we'll wait for f Friday and have Councilman Scott tell the story that he would always tell me as somebody who grew up near Tawanda, mm -hmm. but would go down to Druid Hill to use the pool at Druid Hill because the one at Tawanda was so terrible. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Okay. If, if there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank you, Director Vondrasek, and Thank you, Mr. Klein, and, and everyone who was here to present. Uh, this hearing stands in recess until tomorrow, until tomorrow, until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you.